my left shoulder. Dave Kowalski, would you mind to begin? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all. You can be seated. This debate this evening is co-sponsored by the following town committees and their chairmen. The Georgetown Democratic Town Committee, Chairman Paul Nelson, who's right here down the front. The Georgetown Republican Town Committee, Chairwoman Ann Tentindo, who's over here. The Groveland Democratic Town Committee, whose chairman is Dave Kowalski, he's in the back over here as well. And I am Leanne Berry, I'm the chairman of the Groveland Republican Town Committee. I want to thank you all for your questions that you kindly submitted. They've all been categorized and reviewed for duplication, and our moderator is organizing them as we speak, and she will be presenting the questions to the candidates. I'd like to acknowledge the following public officials in attendance this evening. We have uh, Gary Fowler, Georgetown Selectman. I saw you come in, Gary. You're in the back. Hi there. We have Kathy Pasquina, who's the Democratic State Committee woman. And we have Kim and Campo, who's the Republican State Committee woman as well. I'd like to extend hey, special thanks. Glenn Kemper is a selectman in West Newburgh. Glenn Kemper, how did I miss you? I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and we have Glenn Kemper, selectman from West Newberry. Thank you. Special thanks are extended to the Georgetown Town Hall for allowing us to have our event here. The Georgetown and Groveland Cable Television. Thank you so much, guys, in the booth, and any press who is in attendance this evening. <clears throat> Our moderator this evening is Ann Cobley. She is the president of the North Andover Andover chapter of the League of Women Voters. Among several community-related activities, Ann has been most active with the Andover North Andover League over the last four years, first serving as treasurer and this year's president. This is her second year operating her moderating services. She ran for selectman last spring in Andover, so she understands both being on both sides of the podium, and we thank you so much for being a part of this. So welcome, Anne. Possession of all the questions. She's moving herself. Okay, I want to go over a few ground rules so we all understand. Um, the idea is to keep things very objective, nonpartisan, and fair. So if I do anything that uh, if I lose track, I'm counting on you all to get me back on track. And hearing in the back, they did. Oh, okay. Can everybody hear? No. I'm sorry. I'll try to speak up. There's it, a mic right there. So I, I know, and I see the microphone. Okay. Thank you. All righty. Okay. That's okay. We'll talk loud. Yeah. yeah they, it's been my experience that candidates know how to speak loud. Yeah. Unfortunately, the system will not allow you to increase in... Uh, Oh, okay. Okay. all right. So all just right. speak loudly. Just speak loudly. That's, right. that's great. We can do that. All righty. So thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you for submitting your very thoughtful questions. We've done our best to organize them by category. We'll try to do our best to cover a variety of topics so that you can hear the candidates' uh, positions and rationale behind those positions. and go to the polls with the best informed opinion so you can participate in democracy. Okay, so I want to give you a few guidelines. Uh, the candidates are going to provide an opening statement. They each get up to three minutes. And we have, uh, after that, we're going to alternate questions. Uh, I will present the questions. Each candidate will have up to two minutes to answer the question. Uh, they will have an optional 60-second rebuttal. If the topic still seems that we have 
unfinished business at my discretion. I will allow additional rounds to continue with the provision that for each each candidate will we, there will be a fair if you get one you get one okay, okay. Uh, okay. Um, I have been instructed that we are going to be very strict on the timekeeping we have timekeepers we are computerized so when the uh, red sign is flashed I'm going to say thank you and we will move on all right for the audience, I'm going to ask you to please silence your phones and any other devices that you have. We are being broadcast live. We want to make sure that there are no extraneous noises or interruptions because we are strictly timing this. We do not want to take away from the valuable time and, and information that the candidates are providing. I'm sure you all agree. Okay. Now, we do ask that the candidates are very respectful of each other and that there are no personal references to to either of one of the other of you okay <laughs> just like in school <laughs> All right. I think we've pretty much covered the ground rules so there will be a green card when you can commence your response, a yellow card when there are 30 seconds remaining, and of course the red card will indicate when your time is done. Shall seconds. we get started? Um, we need a coin. We, we need a coin. <laughs> we usually do this ahead of time, but everyone will have the fun of seeing this happen on camera. <laughs> dime. It's there a dime. <laughs> These are tough times. <laughs> hey, buddy, can you Brother spare can you spare a dime? A dime. <laughs> okay. Right. Um, Did you call it last time? You call it this time. You call it. Yeah. Okay. I'll call it heads as well. Okay. And it's tails. It's tails. So I'll go you first. may choose. You want to go first. Okay. So we have a three minute opening statement. Very good. Thank you. And thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, I want to thank all the town committees for putting this together and for being our moderator. Uh, my name is Lenny Mira. I'm running for state rep. I'm a lifelong resident of Massachusetts. I live in West Newbury with my two sons, Anthony and Nicholas. I've worked in the private sector my whole life, mostly at Mira Company, our family-owned construction company, right up the street here in Georgetown. I've been there since 1986. I also started another company with my sons called T&M that installs outdoor publicity displays. Now, these companies are doing well. We've been pretty busy. And when I tell people I know that I'm running for the seat, the question comes up, why would you run for state rep? Mira Company is gangbusters busy why this and there's two reasons number one is because of the things you see in the newspapers you've seen the stories um, three house speakers in a row indicted we got a probation department under investigation for uh, selling jobs plus the everyday patronage hiring the pension abuse the wasteful spending but the second answer to that question is even more important it's what you do not read in the media we have currently the highest per capita debt in America. We have unfunded pension and health care liabilities at the state level and unfunded pension and health care at our municipal municipalities as well. And these are very serious problems, but they can be fixed. But I don't think we're ever going to get out of this mess unless and until we have a healthy two-party system. Currently on Beacon Hill, Democrats have 80% of our state reps. They have 90% of our state senators. They've got the governor, the lieutenant governor, the auditor, the treasurer, the attorney general. We are the most one-party state in America. Now, I think we need to change this, and I am running as an outsider. I am running as a reform candidate. I know many of you have heard that many times before, but I want you to know I'm putting my money where my mouth is. Unlike my opponent, I am not accepting any donations from any special interest groups. By not taking this money, I will never be beholden to any group. Now, what I bring to the table is over 25 years of working in the private sector as a construction worker, as a manager, as a landlord, and as an entrepreneur. This has given me a lot of experience growing businesses and creating jobs. My opponent, on the other hand, will be boasting tonight about his experience of creating rules and laws and regulations and imposing these on people and businesses. Now, I've done that a little bit as well. When I lived in Groveland, I served on the Conservation Commission. Unlike my opponent, however, I've also been on the other side of that table. I saw what it's like to comply with all these rules and regulations. I had to meet a payroll every week and turn a profit every year while dealing with all these 
laws and regulations. Now, right now in Beacon Hill, we're full of the kind of people who have been in government too long. Lawyers and government bureaucrats who don't seem to realize how they're driving people and businesses out of Massachusetts. We need some true outsiders in Beacon Hill to provide a fresh way of doing things and to make Massachusetts a good place to live and do business. That is what I have to offer. I ask you for your vote in November to help me make that happen. All set? Ready, folks. Good. Oh, good evening. My name is Barry Fogel. I'm from West Newbury, and I'm the Democratic candidate for this position. I want to thank you all for coming here tonight. I want to thank the folks who are watching at home. I'd like to thank the chairs of the four committees for helping organize this, and Ann Coblay, thank you very much for agreeing to be our moderator. Mm -hmm. uh, and thanks to Lenny for agreeing to join me in this debate. Along with Georgetown and Groveland, this district includes Merrimack, West Newbury, Newbury, two precincts in Boxford, and two precincts in Haverhill. During tonight's discussion, I intend to give you a clear example of how I will deliver results for the second Essex district. Here are four highlights of my plan. First. I will improve conditions for local businesses and jobs. I will boast about my record, but it's not creating regulations. It's helping businesses in Massachusetts keep and add jobs in Massachusetts. By complying with the regulations and by conforming to the rules, they've been able to grow their businesses with my help. One part of my plan for improving the economy is to reduce unfair tax burdens. I will work to lower the sales tax. I will work to establish a fair tax for online purchases. And I will work to lower unemployment insurance rates as our economy continues to improve, to lift that burden from our small businesses. Second, I will work for continued further reform in public expenditures to ensure that taxpayer funds are being used to maximum benefit for all of us. A lot of progress has been achieved in recent years on pension reform and EBT reform. But much more does need to be done. And I will work for further changes. And I will do so, however, without demeaning the vast majority of recipients of transitional assistance who qualify and comply with the rules in place. Third, I will push for increased local aid, both for the general cherry sheet revenues that comes to cities and towns and Chapter 70 funding for our schools. We can have strong and safe schools that give our children a top quality education, but we can do it at the same time as we provide solid support for our seniors, our police, and fire, and other local programs. These increases in state aid will help reduce the burden you pay in your local property taxes. Fourth, I will work hard to secure maximum benefits from state programs for the enhancement of our environment and the recreational resources we have in this district like the Merrimack River and Plum Island and other open space, as well as the infrastructure improvements for roads and bridges. I believe I can make a real difference for you and for our communities. My commitment is to work hard to solve our problems and to improve the quality of life here in the district. I want to be your ambassador to Beacon Hill with integrity, independence, and transparency. So I'm asking for your vote on November 6th. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. The first question, because I don't vote in this district, and I don't know either one of you. So convince me, why do you see yourselves, each of you, as the better candidate as a state rep than your opponent? Me and first? You, you got the coin toss. Very good. Yes, I believe I'm the better candidate because I'm a lot different than what you see on Beacon Hill now. As I said in my opening statement, Beacon Hill is full of people that have just been there too long, and they're the same kind of people. They're lawyers and government bureaucrats, nothing wrong with that. We do need people like that, but there's not enough people there that have small business experience. Very different than big business. Big business corporations have lobbyists that get things done by basically getting in bed with, with, with government. Small business doesn't have that luxury. Small business has to do it from the ground up. They have to compete in a free and open market. And I've been doing that my entire life. I've never worked at a big business. It's always been at a small business. It requires job creation. It requires risk taking. And what the people on Beacon Hill don't seem to understand is that it's not just the taxes that stifle this kind of growth. It's the regulations. Right now, you have to spend, uh, you have to pay about a dozen different fees and taxes just to put a truck on the road. And this was shocking to my opponent. And he even made a quip about it in his Facebook page. And 
a housewife right here in Georgetown actually took him to school on that and listed each and every fee and tax that had to be paid. That's just to put a truck on the road. When it comes time to actually hire people, the regulations are so stiff and so difficult, you would swear government is trying to make you not hire people. It's a very difficult thing to, um, to do. It's difficult to keep people on a payroll and comply. And the problem with most of the people on Beacon Hill is that they don't see that because they've never done this. They've never started a small business, never had to go out and hire people, never had to fight to keep them on their payroll. And you'll notice it's not happening in Massachusetts right now. Sure, big businesses are able to flourish. Businesses that have the highly paid lobbyists or businesses that get tax credits and benefits. But the small kind of business, like in my business construction, you don't see that happening in Massachusetts. You don't see those being created. They are being created, but they're doing it in New Hampshire. It's easier to do it there, it's cheaper to do it there, it's faster to do it there. And we can't whistle past that graveyard any longer. We need to fix our regulations. There's a lot to respond to there. First of all, an attack on lawyers and bureaucrats is an old saw. There are 40 lawyers in the State House of Representatives, 40 out of 160. That's, that's just, to say that there are too many lawyers is inaccurate, number one. Number two, I help business create and keep jobs in Massachusetts. I have spent a lot of time in my career with the Small Business Association of New England, with the Associated Industries of Massachusetts, which is big and small companies. And, and they help companies, and they've looked to people like me to help them work through the system. I just heard my opponent mention that the Merrick Company is going gangbusters, and yet he says that Massachusetts is stifling business. How can you say it? both ways. Either the regulations are there and they're working and the business is growing and it's doing well, but to then turn around and attack Massachusetts as if it's not working is inconsistent. On the issue of the 12 taxes or fees for putting a truck on the road, what actually happened is I read something that my opponent said that it takes 12 taxes to put a dump truck on the road. And I simply asked through the Facebook page, I wonder what those 12 taxes are. The house, housewife in Georgetown that took me to task was actually the chair of the town Republican committee. But what she clarified for me was that it was a couple of taxes, the sales tax on the truck, the property tax on the garage where you store the truck, and then all the fees that we all pay, inspection fees, licensing fees, uh, and the like, so registration fees. That's to make trucks safe. And so to complain about it, when we all drive on these roads and bridges that we have out here, and we want them to be under repair and not damaged by unsafe trucks, and not to be at risk driving down the road by unsafe trucks, I have to wonder what is really the question that's being raised. Rebuttal? Mr. Mayor, would One you like rebuttal? to use your rebuttal? Please. Please. <clears throat> these taxes and rules and regulations don't hurt a large established company like Mirror Company. We've been in business 60 years. We can pay those. I have a team of people in my office that do this every single year. They got it down pat. Who it hurts is the guy that comes to Mirror Company and learns how to run a backhoe or dump truck and wants to go out on his own. That used to happen a lot at Mirror Company, often the guy's first job out of high school or college. And you don't see that happening right now because there's too many hoops to jump through. He mentioned a sales tax, six and a quarter percent. Well, a new dump truck is $150,000. Do the math. The sales tax alone is about $10,000, and that's just one tax. And I don't even mind the amount of money. The problem is for someone to start a new company and lift themselves out of poverty, like my family did. When they came here, they had nothing. And no one was going to give them a job with a fourth grade education, barely speaking the language. They had to start their own business. And that's how we need poor people to raise themselves out of poverty now. And it's not happening. The rich are getting richer. The poor have seen their wages stagnate. And this is one of the reasons why. Thank you. Mr. Fogel, do you wish to use your I do. rebuttal? Um, I just have to say that if somebody, there are people starting businesses in Massachusetts all the time. I worked with companies who have trucking companies and they, what they did, for example, on the Big Dig project, the larger companies would actually use women businesses and minority owned businesses, people with two, three, four trucks and they would aggregate the trucks for the job. There were plenty of companies and small businesses with trucks, apparently they didn't struggle that hard to get started. And I have to raise this point. I'm sorry, but I have to raise this point. In my campaigning, I have heard from people that there was a report on Fox 25 <laughs> News that reported that the Federal Motor Carrier Administration 
had data showing that in 2010, Mira Company's trucking business was the second worst in the state for safety regulations. There is a, there's a report on that website. That's information that you can access yourself. I don't know what that means, but all I know is that the questionability of regulations, I wonder what it means for public safety. I'd like to move on to a somewhat related question. If you're once, if elected, could you speak up a little bit, please? Yeah, louder. Thank you. If elected, aside from the generic sound bite of creating jobs, what other areas of legislation would you pursue, and can you be a little specific? Mr. Fogel, sure. you go first. Yeah. Uh, one area of legislation I would pursue is uh, there are. Um, a, there's a bill pending for mass works infrastructure and that would provide up to a million dollars for towns with fewer than 7,000 people that's a lot of towns unfortunately Georgetown's too big to qualify but a number of the other towns in this district are below that level that's a significant amount of money so I would urge sponsor and support that legislation uh, I also would continue to support legislation for reforms ethic reforms there was just a story in today's Herald about the problems with hiring and and people with relatives in government um, not disclosing that they have relatives in government when they're applying for jobs. I question that as much as Lenny does. I agree with him, uh, and he agrees with me that there's no place for that in government. So I support further reforms in that area. Uh, I also want to see something done about infectious diseases out there. I mean, we can't have this going on where mosquito-borne diseases, uh, Tripoli and West Nile virus, and uh, and tick-borne diseases. We've got to do something to try to encourage solutions to that because that's one of the most important things in the quality of life in our area. We all want to be outdoors. So that's an important area in terms of public health. I would want to support uh, increases in the minimum wage. Not a lot, but you know, it, somebody making $8 an hour right now is really struggling. And for the kind of work that people do at that rate. So it's not just creating jobs, but it's making sure that people who are working hard at least have enough to make a living wage. Uh, that's a couple of examples. I also, uh, beyond legislation, there's the oversight role of the state legislature, post audit. We pass a law, the agency adopts regulations, and then they implement the program. It's the job of the legislature to then follow up and see that the goal of the legislation is being implemented. It's not just we passed a law and we're done. The job of a legislator is to stay on top and make sure that our shared goals are being achieved. Mr. Mayor? Other than creating jobs, uh, I've listed on my website since day one of my campaign, I listed four areas I wanted to reform. Uh, number one was welfare reform, number two was immigration, then there was pension reform and ethics reform. Now, those four areas are important to me, not just because Beacon Hill is doing a terrible job at those things, but also because fixing them will free up money to spend in areas that we could better use it. By fixing welfare reform and immigration reform, it will provide the Commonwealth with more money to spend on schools, on infrastructure. Right now, especially like with uh, immigration reform, we really don't know how much we're spending on, say, welfare for immigrants. And it's an issue that my friend Jim Lyons, who used to have this area, is now a state rep in Andover, he fought for that. He's one of the only people on Beacon Hill that will fight for that because there's just too few Republicans to back him up. But that one measure alone, if we could just control welfare going to illegals, it would free up not just the money we spend on those programs, but also because it'll make it harder for people in the construction business to hire illegals and pay them under the table at below minimum wage. And speaking of minimum wage, um, I would just say that I'd be against raising the minimum wage in just this state. We're already uncompetitive enough. We already have people and businesses moving to New Hampshire, and I think if we raise it just on our residents and businesses in Massachusetts would be forced to pay more, I just think more businesses would, would move to New Hampshire. So if the feds raise the minimum wage, that's different. If New Hampshire was under the same rules, as Massachusetts, that would be different. It would be more competitive. But I think raising the minimum wage just for uh, our citizens would be, uh, I think, would be suicidal. I think it would hurt a lot of the small businesses, would hurt restaurants, would hurt the uh, small stores. And any business that pays minimum wage, I think it would just drive more of them over the border. Mr. Fogel, do you wish to use your I rebuttal? Would. Yes, thank you. 
we've been listening to the everyone's moving to New Hampshire story for decades, and it hasn't happened yet. I, I, when I get on the highway, <laughs> when I, okay, there you go. When I drive to Boston every day, I see more New Hampshire and Maine plates, plates coming south to work in our state. I also would say that um, the, my opponent cited a Forbes magazine report recently about, and he, and he cherry-picked out the one statistic that had to do with where Boston ranked in terms of business in one category, and he ignored the rest of it in terms of our quality education, our quality recreation, our quality housing. And Boston was ranked, along with Cambridge, was ranked far higher than Rockingham County in southern New Hampshire and Manchester, New Hampshire. People want to be in Massachusetts. If New Hampshire was so great, it would have six million people and we would have a million. So I completely disagree with that, with that scare tactic of if we don't make things better, and if we try to make things better in Massachusetts, everyone's going to migrate to New Hampshire. Thank you. Mr. Mary? Thank you. The fact of the matter is New Hampshire had a higher GDP for several years in a row now, and their unemployment rate has been lower for several years in a row now. I think we've whistled past this graveyard long enough. It's just not New Hampshire. It's also the southern part of the country. Sure, some businesses can do well here. If you're a high-tech firm and you, or if you're a company that's in an industry that has highly paid lobbyists, you can do well here. And if, if you're a lawyer, you can probably do well here. But if you're a small business, you have a hard time. It's not the same. And uh, the test scores in New Hampshire, you can mock them all you want, but their SAT scores are just as good as ours, and they spend substantially less per student doing it. Now, it's not just about New Hampshire. It's also about the rest of the country. I don't want to lose any more people, and I don't want to lose any more businesses. We just lost a congressman after the last census. We lost one 10 years before that, and we lost one 10 years before that one. We're going to lose another one 10 years from now if we stay on this trend. And we're a state that depends a lot on dollars from Washington. We cannot afford to lose any more representation in Washington. Thank you. Well, since this is such an interesting topic, let's let's go a little further into into the business world and talk about state yeah, state sorry. taxes and regulations and rolling back to five percent sales tax. Um, I think we can have a couple of rounds on this one. So if you could share your thoughts and your plans and ideas that you would share if elected. And I think we're starting with, excuse me, we are starting with you. <laughs> is this a two minute, or are we still on a one minute back and forth? How this is a, this? This this is is a two minute so response, because okay, it's yep. a new question. Well, it's, we are already at a disadvantage with the sales tax, um, and I do support rolling it back. Um, but I think we can make up for that loss of revenue with the online sales tax. We shouldn't be harming our brick-and-mortar stores in this district um, and letting people sell goods and, and the like in Massachusetts from on the online without paying the same sales tax. Um, but I also think that uh, the community colleges, uh, making sure, if you remember the governor reported, and I think it was accurate, that the that we have a structural unemployment rate in Massachusetts where the people in Massachusetts who are unemployed aren't skilled, aren't trained with the skills for the jobs that are out there. And he and the legislature passed legislation that would reform how the community college system works and would increase incentives for those community colleges to educate and train people for the jobs that are available. Uh, that's an important move and that was done in our one party state. So I think we're moving in the right direction on that one. Uh, I am concerned about the unemployment rate, uh, the employment insurance rates. I've talked to a number of small businesses here in Georgetown, uh, and that was one of something that I heard very often and first. Unemployment insurance goes up as unemployment goes up because we need more funds in that, in that uh, account in order to pay people for their unemployment. But as this economy improves, and this is, this is typical not just in Massachusetts, as taxes or fees go up, they don't tend to come back down when the problem they're intended to solve comes back down. But I will fight to reduce the unemployment insurance rate so that the small businesses, which is the bulk of the businesses in this district, aren't suffering under that. When they have more money in their pocket, they can hire people. Uh, and that's important. Uh, I also want to take a look at the tax expenditure report. And this is sort of an arcane thing in the legislature, but they found tens of billions of dollars in tax credits going to businesses that we no longer need to give incentives to. And I want to start closing those loopholes. Thank you. Mr. Mayor? Uh, 
Yes, Barry and I are in agreement actually on this. We both want to roll back the sales tax. Uh, we have board of communities here, and they have to compete against tax-free New Hampshire. Uh, we also agree on the brick and mortar. Uh, right now, if you sell, if you have a store that sells books or bicycles, you have to charge a sales tax. If uh, you sell it online, you don't have to charge it. It's kind of an unfair thing. I'm never in favor of raising taxes, but this is not really raising a tax. It's imposing an existing tax on all businesses. So Barry and I agree on that. And uh, the unemployment thing, we also agree on that. Uh, Massachusetts has some of the highest unemployment costs in the entire country. It, it devastates businesses. Once again, it's something else that hurts small businesses a lot more than big businesses. It's not going to hurt, um, you know, a company like Microsoft, if they have a location, it's not going to hurt the, uh, the, the big banks, but it hurts the blue collar guys that have small businesses. It's just another incentive for them to not open up shop here. And another thing on that is when, when businesses aren't opening up, it doesn't just hurt the business owner, it hurts employees. Because when you have too few, say, construction companies like mine, that means workers, from truck drivers to machine operators to laborers, have fewer choices and they have fewer options. It keeps their wages low. And that's one of the reasons why their wages have stagnated, because there's not enough of these kind of companies, these new ones, being built. If there were more of them, if there were more people took that risk and opened up shop as a plumber, an electrician, a sheetrock guy, or a framer, then workers would have more options about where to go to work. And employers, like myself, would be forced to pay them more to keep them. And that is something that's overlooked. Once again, people that have been in an office too long don't realize. They don't really, they think wages and benefits accrue as a result of government action when it's really the free and open market. If there was more of a demand for workers, there would be more wage increases for workers. So it's, Barry and I agree on this and um, I hope it happens. Thank you. Do you wish to use your rebuttal? I would, yes. You know, um, an improving economy is going to make a big difference. When, when the Commonwealth was going through the big dig, it was hard to get a plumber and an electrician. They were all working in Boston. So as you build roads and you build bridges and you build other infrastructure projects, whether it's water or sewer, uh, you're going to get people working again. Uh, our economy is improving faster than the rest of the country's is. Our unemployment rate has dropped faster than the nation's has. Uh, we have been one of only two states in the country that had its bond rating increase uh, coming out of the recession. We went to our highest bond rating ever, which reduces borrowing costs on public works projects here in Massachusetts. We have a $1 billion rainy day fund in the legislature that ensures that if the economy does bump along and doesn't come out of this, I consider it a depression and not just an everyday recession, it's going to take us a while to work out of this. What's the next boom going to need to be in order to create jobs? Well, it's infrastructure improvements, roads, bridges, and infrastructure will create jobs. Thank you. Mr. Merritt, do you want to? Yeah, really quickly, the unemployment rate in Massachusetts might be slightly lower there in some other states, but as we all know, this rate doesn't really include everyone that stopped looking for a job. It doesn't include people that are forced to take part-time jobs because they can't find good full-time jobs. So. It just ticked up again. I still think we're on the wrong road. And once again, it's big businesses that are able to hire. Small businesses are still having a hard time. And Beacon Hill is full of people that, you know, take donations and, and listen to lobbyists that work on behalf of these large companies. But there's not enough people doing it for the blue collar guys, the small workers. You know, it's like most electricians are workers themselves. They, they're owner operators. They're uh, mom and pops. And those are the people that are suffering. And those are the kind of businesses we're not seeing enough of. Um, they need to be helped. Does either of you feel we need another round on that one? I would just like a brief moment to respond to one thing, which I, I took what my opponent just said as being a suggestion that uh, attacking me as being someone who takes support from special interests and won't be interested in what serves all of you and, and the rest of the community. I'm an outsider as well. I've never run for public office before. I'm a reformer. When I worked at DEP, I changed the way Mass DEP ran in the central regional office. We won an award in that regional office for doing multimedia training so that a business didn't see a water pollution inspector, a hazardous waste inspector, and an air quality inspector three different times. I, we had cross training so that that business would have one inspector show up. They do all of the inspections, and the businesses loved it. And so the suggestion that somehow, and I don't know if it's the implication that I'm a lawyer only, but that doesn't matter. That helps me know about lawmaking and it helps me know about government. 
But what matters is that I will be someone who will work to make businesses grow here by knowing how to support businesses and not just making laws or regulations. Mr. Mayor? Thank you. All right, I'd like to change the topic for a moment. And we're going to move to health care and health care delivery. Do you believe that health care coverage is a universal right? And why or why not? You first? And yes. Yeah, this is a question that came up in our debate Monday out in Haverhill. Is health care a right? And I said then, and I'll say now, I'm not an attorney. I don't know if health care is a right. I don't see it anywhere in the Constitution. But I would hope that it would be something like our other necessities, like food, like clothing, like housing. Those things have never been called rights. But in America, everyone seems to be able to get those and do pretty well, better than any other country in the world. So is it a right? I think that's the wrong question. The question should be, how do we make health care more affordable? How do we make it more accessible? Well, I would go back to looking at the systems of food and clothing and housing. We use a free market system on those things. And supply and demand is a very powerful thing and is much more effective than any government program. If we look around the world at systems that work and systems that do not work, it can kind of give us a guiding light on what to do. Now, many people assume that every country in Europe has socialized medicine, which is not really true. Some countries do. Um, where my family comes from, Italy, yeah, they have socialized medicine there. They have it in Greece. They have it in Spain and Portugal. You'll notice they have it in all the countries that are going broke. But <laughs> not every country has it. You look at it, the most powerful economy in Europe is Germany. And Germany doesn't have real socialized medicine. They have a decentralized. Now, the government requires you to have insurance in Germany. But once you have it, all the health care providers have to compete. From insurance companies to doctors and hospitals, they have to compete. And that makes prices go down, and it makes value go up. And it doesn't mean we have to copy the system or write the letter, but it's just a system we can look at for guidance. And the one thing that just sticks out is, like I said, competition. By using the free market, we can make health care go up in quality and go down in price. And Massachusetts is the perfect place for this. We've got the best hospitals, the best colleges in the world. We should be using them. They provide high-tech advances that have created a lot of wealth in this country. They can do the same thing for health care. Thank you. Mr. Fogel? We have the great benefit of living in Massachusetts. We have universal coverage for people, and we have just had legislation passed and signed by the governor that puts a cap and starts bending the curve on health care costs in Massachusetts. We're leading the country. That's something that Mitt Romney is running away from, but he was part of, he joined with the Democratic uh, legislature that apparently is such a problem now uh, to, to lead this country. Our legislature is a crucible of innovation. Why is it that so many things we do in Massachusetts the rest of the country looks to? Health care is one of them. And I don't know why Republicans tend to want to say, I don't know if it's a right or a privilege. Maybe it's a legal issue. Maybe it's a concern about that might lead to a single payer system. We don't need to deal with that. We've got universal coverage in Massachusetts. And what I do think matters is that we're headed in the right direction. What concerns me, though, is that we need more money for local health care. We need to support the Merrimack Hospital in Haverhill. We need to support Anna Jakes. We need the senior centers. Where I've been to so many of the councils on aging and seen people who benefit from the wellness and the holistic care that they get for eyesight and for everything that seniors deal with, as we all hopefully will end up reaching that point. So it's important that we continue to be a leader in health care. My daughter was born three months premature at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Without the medical innovations Lenny just mentioned, she might not be here. It's a marvelous thing, but at the same time, our country is very low on the list on infant mortality and other health care things. If you're going to say that the rest of Europe's not going broke because of health care, they're healthier because of their universal health care. They have other reasons they're going broke, but you can't blame it on their health care system. Uh, I'm very encouraged that we have con cost containment in Massachusetts, and I plan, if I get elected to be on Beacon Hill, that would be one important priority to keep pressing that curve and bending that curve here in the state. Mr. Mayor, do you wish to use your uh, Just again? really quickly on the matter of Romney care and Obamacare. Those were created to lower costs, and I can tell you, as any, anyone here who's had to meet a payroll the last few years under Romney care, 
our health insurance costs haven't gone down. In fact, they've gone up dramatically. We still have one of the highest health care costs in the country. Um, and I hope I'm wrong about it. I hope Romney Care and Obamacare end up working fabulously because that would uh, relieve me and my payroll department from having to struggle with that issue. But in the long run, I'm not sure it's going to work. No one at this table does. We can pretend that we think we're going to know what's going to happen, but historically, when government sticks its nose into industries like that, they very seldom make them more efficient and more economical. Usually the opposite happens. And when you look at what's going broke in Europe, those countries don't have our expenses. They don't have foreign wars. They don't have massive defense spending. How we pay for their defense. They don't have our crime problems, our drug problems. They're able to spend their money on their uh, welfare and entitlement tri um, policies, and they're still going broke. Thank you. Yes, one brief comment. Um, it's not it's not government sticking its nose in to make health care available to people who otherwise would have been denied for a pre-existing condition. That's what government's supposed to do. It's supposed to protect the less fortunate and people who need help like that. The other thing that it did that, that universal coverage does is it makes sure that the healthy population, those young fellows and gals who think that they're 26 and they're immune from an injury, when they blow out their ACL doing something athletic and they go in for the surgery and without any insurance, we pay for it. So part of what it did was it took off the free riders out of the system. When you put good drivers into auto insurance, everybody's rates go down. When you put healthy people into health insurance, everybody's rates go down. And so to criticize government for getting involved in health care when what it does is it protects us from people rushing to the emergency room without insurance for every sniffle and cough and for keeping companies from denying coverage to people with conditions, that's good government. Thank you. Okay. An issue near and dear to my heart. Voting. <laughs> uh, <laughs> would you, what is your position regarding uh, laws requiring proof of ID or photo ID for voters? And we will start with. I went first on the health care. Yes, Barry's we turn. will the start truth, with Mr. Barry's Fogel. Turn. I'm actually surprised it made the list in this debate because we don't have a law in Massachusetts requiring it. And, it, and what I see around the nation is that it's really not a problem. I mean, when they, people study the amount of voter fraud that was alleged that was presumed to justify voter ID, the numbers are incredibly small. We're talking dozens in many instances. Now, at the same time, I'm not on board with saying that it's a focused effort to try to keep people who are of low income or minorities from voting in those states, because even if that's behind it, you can find a way, this, this gets into the rest of the issues in terms of people qualifying for a public program. This is a proxy that's trying to get, I think, people started on trying to restrict people for qualifying for public programs. Voting is a right. We don't have any dispute about that in the Constitution. And anything that impairs somebody's ability to vote is an infringement on their constitutional rights. Now, what has happened, and thankfully it hasn't happened in this district, we don't have people like that here, but down in Boston and some of the big cities, Fall River and New Bedford, there have been instances in Massachusetts where people have intimidated voters who come in who may not speak the language yet, but who are legally here and legally voting and, and, and able to vote and sort of scaring them away or asking them to sign something or prove their identification outside the polls. Completely illegal activity. So there's a small amount of that that goes on in Massachusetts. I'm not concerned that that's happening here in the second Essex. We're a much uh, cleaner brand of folk up here that aren't trying to stop folks from voting. But it's an important issue that if it came up in the state legislature, and I doubt it would, I think I would clearly be against it. Yeah, I disagree with Barry. I think we should have voter ID laws. Yes, of course, voting is a very important right. But you know what? So are my Second Amendment rights. And when I wanted to get a license to buy a gun, I had to get photographed. I had to get fingerprinted. I had to go to my local police department. They did a criminal background check on me. I had to wait a long time for that to come in. And you know what? I didn't mind because as important a right as it is, I want it done correctly. I don't want the wrong people to get a license to carry. By the same token, I don't want the wrong people to be able to vote. You have to pass a certain thing. You have to be a citizen. You can't be a felon. And to say that we don't have this problem, well, no one knows for sure if we have a problem with uh, voter ID or not. You look at that election out in Minnesota where 
Al Franken, a clown, got elected a United States senator, just barely. And it turns out that they screwed up the voting over there. They allowed a bunch of felons to cast ballots that were not supposed to vote. So I, I disagree with Barry. I think we do need voter ID laws. Every single person I've talked to, Democrat and Republican alike, has agreed on this. I don't know why it can't come to some sort of agreement. They talk about the expense of getting an ID, but you know we have a registry of motor vehicles that could provide an ID, not for driving, but just to vote. And I wouldn't even mind if the state ponied up the money to cover the cost so that a poor person doesn't have to pay for that ID. I think the state should absorb the cost. But at least it'll be done correctly, and at least only citizens and qualified people were allowed to vote because yeah it's an important right it's guaranteed under the constitution but like i said it's just like my second amendment rights it's no more important than the right to keep and bear arms so i'm in favor of the id laws thank you do you have a I really do. I wish to address this i do um i've never seen anybody hurt anyone else with a vote um number one <laughs> number two um massachusetts with its more uh with its increased regulation on, on gun permits, we actually have less gun crime in Massachusetts per capita than other states around us that are more liberal with their gun permitting. Um, and I, I'm, I'm fine with the way Massachusetts is right now. I've talked to police officers in the region and um, they've indicated that they're comfortable with Massachusetts gun laws right now. Uh, but if, if someone can demonstrate to me, this is what I've said before about interest groups. I'll listen to the pro-gun lobby. I'll listen to the anti-gun lobby. I'll listen to the pro-voter ID lobby. Bring me information. My door is open. If, if you didn't contribute to my campaign, you get just as much time as anybody who did. I want to know if there's a problem in Massachusetts with voter ID, then we'll address it. But until show, someone shows me there's a problem, it's a, it's a non-issue. Uh, yeah, really quickly, um, I'll question those gun statistics. New Hampshire has very loose gun laws, as does Vermont and Maine, and I think they probably have actually less gun violence than Massachusetts. But I actually agree with Barry as far as we still need reasonable gun laws, all in favor of that. But I still disagree on the voter ID law. I, I just think it's common sense. Every You go around the, the country, other con even other states, I think, require at least a signature or something to vote. Um, we won't know how much fraud there is in our voting unless and until we actually look into it. Thank you. All righty. The next question. We have, I'm sorry? Louder. Oh, all right. We're on to our next question. We hear the words transparency used in politics a lot these days. Please describe your view of what this really means and try to be specific. And we are... Can you repeat that? Yeah. Wow. We hear the words transparency used in politics a lot these days. Please describe your view of what this means and please try to be specific. And Mr. Mira will start. Two minutes. Uh, to me, it means that government has to reveal what it's doing at all times. You know, Barry and I were on the conservation commissions in our respective towns. When selectmen do their thing, they have, you know, open meeting laws they have to adhere to. If for some reason, there just seems to be less transparency on Beacon Hill. I'm not sure why, um, but I think there just has to be a lot more of it. Just recently, the few Republicans that are, are on the Hill, on Beacon Hill, um, passed a law requiring the, uh, the Commonwealth to adhere to the same kind of laws and be able to, to, to provide information that the media is requesting. And it's, it's, it's not being adhered to. So to me, what it means is, Everything in government, everything that government is doing needs to be revealed to the public. Uh, we pay the taxes. Those people down there work for us. We ought to be able to know at all times what they're doing and why. So transparency to me, to answer your question, means that everything should be out in the open. Everything should be recorded. I mean, this is being recorded, and it's just something that should be a no-brainer. But I, it's one of those things that I don't think we're ever going to get it until we have a two-party system. When one party is allowed to dominate the way it is in this state, I just think they keep finding ways to get around it. We supposedly had ethics reform passed a year ago. And to this day, the front page of the Herald has the probation department still giving raises and promotions to people who, surprise, surprise, have relatives all over Beacon Hill and all over state government. That was something that was supposed to be revealed a year ago. Everyone in every department is supposed to reveal who their relatives are in state government. And to this day, they still haven't done it. So. Once again, not to beat a dead horse, but I just think we need 
a two-party system, and I don't think we'll ever get this kind of transparency unless and until we do. Thank you. Um, let me start with that one point, and I agree with Lenny. I am a huge fan of the open meeting law and the public records law. I fight all the time with local boards and state agencies to get access to records for my clients and to make sure we know what's going on. Same thing with local boards. And so uh, I actually will advocate, which will not make the leadership on Beacon Hill happy, for the open meeting law and the public records law to apply to the legislature. And that's an important point. I'm not going there to be part of the leadership on Beacon Hill. It doesn't matter that I'm a Democrat. I'm going up there to make sure that the law is enforced and is passed properly. Uh, I have experience to do that. If I were half my own age now and I was looking to make a career out of being a state representative, that might be different if somebody wanted to accuse me of going up there to just hang out and go along to get along. That's not the case. I'm going up there to make sure things are done right. And if that ends up putting me in the basement where Harriet ended up because she stood up to them, then so be it. We've had 18 years of a representative who took it on the chin a couple times for standing up to, to Tom Finneran and to the other speakers. And she got elected doing it, and people respected her for it, and I'm going to do the same thing if I'm elected. So that's number one. Number two, my record will be on the record. You'll know who I'm meeting with. If my calendar has that I'm meeting with the Mass Association of Realtors at 1 o'clock, you'll know it. If Paul Nelson's coming in to talk to me about community preservation funds, you'll know it. And if any of you comes in to talk to me, everyone will know it. So let's talk about one last thing, campaign finance. Um, you know, the amount of contribution that's given to a state representative can't exceed $500. There isn't a single group in the state that's going to gain any advantage giving a contribution to a state representative of $500. That doesn't get them anything other than a meeting that you'll know about. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, do you wish to use your rebuttal? Can I add one more thing? Um, well, he, he's forfeited his, so... No, I don't want yeah, to. Well, well, we're still in the one minute, one minute. I have a rebuttal, right? He has nothing to rebut, too, if Lenny's not rebutted. But he's had the option to use it, Equal so. Time. Equal time. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. They have set, That's okay. they have set the rules. I That's have all right. to abide no by. No problem. I, they set the rules. We follow the rules. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. All right. So uh, we are moving on to education. Uh, <laughs> do you feel the Chapter Drums. 70 public school funding needs needs to be revamped, and how would you evaluate such an effort? And we are starting with... Yeah. Yes, okay. Do you feel that Chapter 70 public school funding needs to be revamped, and how would you evaluate such an effort? And Mr. Fogel, you will go first. It does need to be revamped. Um, no one can figure it out. <laughs> there are so many factors involved in that. What ends up happening is that if enough legislators on Beacon Hill of any party see more funding coming to their district, they're comfortable with the formula. And so what has to happen here is that the representative from this district, we have uh, so many regional school districts in, our, in, this, in this representative district and right now, Triton will have three separate state representatives. Pentucket will have one. Boxford will have a couple. The, the, the Masco system will have more than one. And Georgetown here, you are all alone in terms of being the only community in your school district, but you'll have one state representative. But what ends up happening is it's important. If I see something in the formula that, that representatives in western Massachusetts see, that's harming their funding and that somebody on the Cape, a couple of representatives see down there, will form a coalition. That's part of being able to work together on Beacon Hill. And so while somebody needs to go in there and stand up to the leadership if they're on the wrong track, at the same time, the representative, if it's me, needs to be able to work with representatives and try to build a coalition to change that formula so that we benefit. If you guys read the local papers, you see your local state representatives cutting ribbons on public works projects and Mike Costello saved the depuration plant on Plum Island where the local clams are cleaned before they go to the restaurants. That's the kind of thing that only happens in the budget if somebody's working together with the rest of the representatives and isn't uh, fighting with them over every issue. 
so now that we're starting fresh after 18 years of Harriet Stanley's uh, being in this position, the question again, as I mentioned earlier, is who do you want to be your ambassador on Beacon Hill? Who's going to go up there and get funding for the schools by working well with the other representatives to make that happen? I think that's me. Yes, this is something else that Barry and I both agree on. Uh, Chapter 70 funding does need to be reviewed. The, the laws dealing with this were written about 20 years ago, and it's a very complicated formula, as Barry stated. It's based upon incomes and assessed values of homes, and these things have been working against us. And if you look at the legislation, there was wording in there 20 years ago that said the formula is supposed to be reviewed every two years. Well, of course, in typical Beacon Hill fashion, they just never got around to reviewing the formula. And as a result, people in the Second Essex and in small towns have been shortchanged. We really have been. Now, interesting side note, actual funding for Chapter 70 is, is up. It's up 25% um, over the past 10 years. But you'll notice we didn't get 25% more funding. Instead, that money went to the bigger cities. And it's a result of that formula. So um, I'm glad Barry agrees with this because it's a, it's a vitally important thing. It, it's a, we're talking a lot of money, and it's probably the first thing that the state rep in this area just needs to start working on. As far as how to get it done, well, the Republicans on Beacon Hill have been trying to do that, and there just haven't been enough of them to do it. As you know, Democrats usually win the elections in these big cities, so of course they don't want to see the formula change. It's, it's the people in the small towns that want to see a change because we're the ones getting shortchanged. Our success is being held against us. They just think we have plenty of money, we don't need any more. Well, as you all know, we're, we're struggling despite what they may think. Um, when we have small towns like mine in Western, we don't have any commercial development. So the homeowners have to pay the entire tax bill. We don't have commercial buildings to help us defray that. So the taxes like on a house like mine are almost $10,000 a year. But you go to these big cities, their individual tax bills are a lot lower because they have commercial development. Going to Lynn, Lawrence, Lowell, the, the taxes on a house there are substantially less because they have a lot more commercial development and they get a lot more of this Chapter 70 money. So glad Barry agrees. I think it's the first thing we should work on. Thank you. Mr. Fogel, do you wish to rebut? I, I will add one comment that um, the other element of funding for schools is the transportation reimbursement for uh, the communities in this district. That, I've heard that a lot from people. I will work hard to increase that. There's another element of that transportation piece. Our communities here, we're not a lot of small towns with centers with sidewalks that a lot of population lives at. So even people who live close to a school, they don't, they don't qualify for the free bus service. They have to pay a lot of money to catch the bus. So if you have, they have little children, even if the school is just across the way, they might be having to cross a state road to get there and, and that they don't qualify. So I would work hard to make sure that in the circumstances where people otherwise would not qualify because of their proximity to the school, if it's a situation where there's a danger to children being able to walk to the school, they should be included in the transportation funding and we should increase state funding for the transportation reimbursement. Mr. Mayor? Any further comment? Uh, just really quickly, yeah, this is something else that Barry and I actually agree on. Of course, I'm a little biased. I'm in the construction industry. Of course, I want to see more money spent on transportation. Uh, my company doesn't do roads and bridges. It's not like I'm going to benefit. But I'm in that industry. I have a lot of friends and relatives that are. But it helps us all. When government borrows and borrows and borrows, you know, I'm against it. But if we spend it on things like transportation, at least we're handing our children and future generations something they can use. If we're spending it on everyday expenses, of course, that's not the case. But when we spend it on a road, a bridge, a sidewalk, we're giving future generations something they can use. It makes our communities better. So couldn't agree more. I, I think uh, we do need to spend more on this. It, it gets back to infrastructure as well. But let's just keep in mind, we need to do this in the context of a Commonwealth, a state that is already borrowing more than just about any other state. Per capita, we have the highest debt in the country. We must always keep that in mind. And in order to spend more on transportation, we need to cut spending elsewhere. Thank you. All right. The state legislature mandated that teachers obtain a master's degree. The district's special education population is somewhere around 16%. Yet most teachers are not qualified or certified to instruct students with special needs. Would you be willing to spearhead an initiative to require all teachers to be certified in special education as this could have a positive cost savings impact? 
Who goes first on that one? <laughs> Can I Doesn't read matter. that? It, it's I know. up for grabs. Can I'd like to hear it again too, Barry. Yeah. yeah, to with you. yeah I, there's motion a lot, to, lot motion to, to move the issue to another issue. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, this That's is pretty going complicated. to be Mr. Mirror is going to respond to this one first. <laughs> Can you repeat it again, though? I sure <laughs> will. I, yield to the I sure will. Oh, okay. Pretty tough. The state legislature mandated that teachers obtain a master's degree. The district's special education population is somewhere around 16%, yet most teachers are not qualified or certified to instruct students with special needs. Would you be willing to spearhead an initiative to require all teachers to be certified in special education as this could have a positive cost savings impact? Now, I, I, I can't speak to the, the, the yeah, that's details on, on this. Well, let's answer the question. I mean, I mean if would I spearhead an initiative? Do the best you could. Yeah, the way it's, the question is phrased, if it would save funds, uh, yeah, of course. Um, I'm not an educator. Um, I'm not a professional in that field. And I'd like to speak to people that are. Um, real quickly in special education, it, it hasn't been funded the way it's supposed to be. but. Um, would I spearhead an initiative if, if it meant improving the services and, and um, saving funds? Yeah, absolutely. Of course I would. Go ahead, Barry. <laughs> <laughs> Take it from here. He yields his time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> special education is a, a challenge for our public schools. And one thing I've learned about the Pentucket system is that because there are only small numbers of children who need special education in each of the three communities, they actually combine them into one of the communities. So Merrimack, for example, has all of the children in the elementary system who need special education. Then they get criticized for having the lower MCAS scores. And so, <laughs> You know, th th that I hear that from folks in the, other, in the communities. And so we have to make sure that the funding is available. That's number one. Number two, when charter schools are established, they don't take children with special needs. And so what ends up happening is they don't reimburse the district from which the child has moved uh, enough money for the remaining group of children who need additional funding for their educational needs. Now, I support charter schools to a certain extent. I think it's good to have competition, but it can't be at the expense of our public education system, and that's one area where I think I've seen a problem. Um, I also will say this. I have the Mass Teachers Association endorsement. I had to fight for it, actually, because when I answered their questionnaire the first time, they thought I was far too uh, away from their positions. Um, I didn't say yes to all of the questions they had. I said, I need more information. And so when I went in to interview with them, it was really not me talking. It was me listening and hearing what they said about the issues that they were asking about. Uh, and so what they learned was they had somebody who's an ally in supporting education, somebody who supports teachers. I received teacher certification in college. And I think, obviously, two things make education possible. A healthy, safe building with modern resources and teachers. And so what we need to do is make sure that they have the support they need. There's been reform in teacher pensions. It's going to increase money available for other purposes. But we definitely need to make sure that the broad spectrum of needs are met. Thank you. Thank you. Now, do you wish to? Uh, just really quickly on education. Yeah, Barry and I agree on supporting uh, public schools. I went to a public school myself. I graduated from Woburn High School. And when it was time to send my own two sons to school, I sent them to the Pentucket system. They went to the Page Elementary School, and they graduated from Pentucket High School. And I would do so again in a heartbeat. It's one of the reasons why I choose to live in this area. Um, the school system is, was first and foremost in choosing a place to live. And I'm not alone. It's one of the reasons why our property values remain high. It's one of the reasons why people want to live here, because they do have a good system. So does Georgetown. And it's, it's something that, you know, government is in charge of. For better or for worse, we decided a long time to put government in charge of education. That being the case, we have to make sure it's done correctly. So Barry and I agree. Good, safe buildings, making sure teachers are educated. And the one thing I'll say about teachers, um, when my kids went through the Pawtucket system, I got to meet a lot of them, not just in parent-teacher meetings, but also off the record in private. And I'll say um, public school teachers are actually the biggest critics of the public school system, but in a good way. They have a lot of very good ideas on how to improve it. And uh, my door would always be open to them. Mr. Fogel. I want to talk about school buildings for a minute. We've been in the Pentucket system going through quite a struggle in terms of uh, safe buildings, 
uh, the elementary school in Merrimack suffered enormous problems with mold, and it went on too long. And it, and, and it depends on the community to step up and tell their administration that it's not, it's not right to send children to an unhealthy school. Um, it, we're going through a rebuilding a, of the Page School in West Newbury, and, and it's going well, I understand. And then you face an issue here in Georgetown of whether to approve funding for a reconstruction of the Penn Brook School. Those are tough decisions, but they're an investment in the future. Uh, nothing could be more important than teaching our children in safe, healthy, modern schools that enable them to keep up with the rest of the world, to get that basic information and education early on so they can continue on and become the leaders of the future. Uh, we've got to have good schools, and I'm glad to hear Lenny express support for the school systems. Okay, thank you. Um, what are your thoughts on supporting and promoting women and minority-owned businesses? And Mr. Fogel, you go first. I think that's important. I, I, that takes me all the way back to my first job out of law school. I was the attorney for the Committee on Transportation and Environment in the District of Columbia City Council. That's the group that obviously is the city council for the district. And at the time, the chairman of that committee was the chairman of the metro system, of the board for the, the uh, rail and bus system. And the metro system at that time did not have a policy for minority and women-owned business uh, incentives. And we worked, we had, we had hearings. Uh, I was involved in conducting those hearings. We heard the substantial num amount of testimony from people who said that it would make a big difference. Uh, the District of Columbia Council passed a legislation to encourage it and open it up to minority and women-owned businesses. The Metro did the same thing. Uh, this is a modern era we're in now. That was, that was uh, 30, year, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, actually. I'm sorry. That, my goodness. 30. I'm feeling old. <laughs> that was 30 years ago. But here in Massachusetts, when I was working with clients um, all through the time, I've seen them bid jobs where minority and women-owned businesses. In the trucking business, too, I'm sure Lenny will confirm that there are a lot of women uh, around the Boston area in particular who started women-owned businesses and minority-owned businesses. And that's part of the, the economy coming up, is having people of, of all backgrounds being able to start a business to compete in the workplace. Uh, and you can well imagine that in some older industries like trucking and construction, uh, and not just trucking construction, but in industries like that, that having the ability to compete, to have the incentives to begin to move the economy into the rest of our society, not just uh, these region that we live in, but throughout the Commonwealth, the, the rising tide lifts all boats. And I'm very much in support of, of uh, minority-owned and women-owned businesses. Okay. Mr. Mayor? Yeah. In the past, we tried to have government do set-asides and uh, affirmative action program to get, increase the number of women and minority-owned businesses. I guess that had a time and a place, but maybe we need to try something different. I mean, I know what I see in my business, in my industry, is a lot of times men will open up companies in their wives' names, and then they can call it a woman-owned business. I think we can do better than that. Instead of requiring government to do that, how about we require, allow the free market system to do that? Now, here a company puts out over 30 crews every single day. Now, some of them go out of my headquarters here in Georgetown. But I have yards in Boston, Worcester, and Taunton where even more crews go out of. And most of the guys I hired in that area are, in fact, inner city minority guys. And just to be clear, I don't do any government work. I don't do any jobs that have quotas or affirmative action requirements. When I hire minority guys, it's because I think they're the best applicant. And my guys are especially proud of that, and they, they should be. And it, it's taught me a lot of lessons. And it's, it's things that people that have been in office don't learn. Um, like I said, when, when I hire a minority guy, it's because I think he is the best worker, I think he's the best applicant. And for some reason, both because of what I mentioned earlier today and for other reasons, these guys are still not taking the next step. I mean, they do great at Mirror Company, they'll become a laborer, and then a crew leader, and then a foreman. But you know what? They're not starting their own businesses. And that is the one single way that people on the lower end of the income scale can ri raise themselves out of poverty, just like my family did. It can still happen, but they're not doing it. There's a lot of reasons. It's very complicated. Um, but government can do that by perhaps changing our educational system. And instead of trying to pretend that every kid's going to go to college, how about we just figure out the obvious truth? Not every kid's going to go to college. And you know what? They don't have to because you can make a great living starting your own business. It's not happening in Massachusetts. 
If we just change a few things um, at the grassroots level, I think it will happen more. It will be helping the people that need it the most. Mr. Fogel, do you wish to? I do. Um, I think what you what was just said actually proves the point. If if Mira Company is hiring minorities, uh, people uh, who then can't go out and start their own business, that indicates, and, and I think Lenny said it accurately, that there may be a number of reasons for it, but it shows that still in our society we need to create opportunities for people to start minority-owned businesses, and that once we've saturated the market with people of, of minority background in business and women in business, and legitimately, I take issue, of course, as you do with the fact that if somebody's gaming the system, that's not right. Uh, I'm in favor of fair and reasonable regulation, and if anybody breaks the rules, I think that that's important to be enforced against. But I think we're still at the point in Massachusetts and in this country where the proper incentives for people to, to start uh, minority and women-owned businesses and to be able to compete fairly for public works projects, we're still at the phase where that's an important part of growing and building our state economy. Mr. Mayor, do you have a rebuttal? Sure, just really quick. Um, my friend and former opponent, um, Gary Fowler, he's a selectman here and a great guy. I ran against him in the primary. Uh, he came to my office just this very morning and wanted to give me his take on why people aren't starting businesses. Um, he gave me this thing, uh, contract documents for Camp Denison septic improvements. Simple little job, right? That's what it is, right there. That is what a contractor or a construction company has to comply with. Everything from, you know, how much you pay your machine operator to where they can, when and where they can start. It's things like this that stifle the growth. If, if you're a young guy trying to start a new business, okay, and like I said, people that start construction companies often didn't go to college, this can be quite daunting. It's very difficult. This could be done by the people, this could be cut into about a 10-page document by the very people in this room, which is common sense changes. It's, it's the kind of thing we need on Beacon Hill, and those simple things will help just everyday people start their own businesses. Thank you. Do we have time for more quest another question, or should we move to closing statements? I think we can move for five minutes so Okay. We actually have a window. We have a two-and-a-half-hour window. We want it. I wish we do Have we gone through eight questions yet? Oh, Nine. I think we have, yes. Um, so I had it down to two more questions, but if you – if it's time to, to go to closing statements, we will. Unless everybody's already lost as much weight as you wanted to lose tonight. Because <laughs> it's a little warm in here. Okay. All right. All right. So closing statements. Okay. Um, I believe Mr. Mir went first for opening statements, so we will go in the reverse order for closing statements. Each candidate has up to three minutes, and Mr. Fogel will go first. Thank you, Ann. Thank you everybody again and for the people watching at home. I'm here tonight because I believe in public service. It's a part of who I am. I began my career working in government, as I just said, and for the past nine years I served on the West Newbury Conservation Commission as a volunteer. So when Harriet Stanley announced two years ago this would be her last term, I immediately began to consider how could I make the commitment to campaign for this office? How could I make that happen? So a year ago, I formed my campaign committee. I started the process of building support, and most important of all, to learn what matters to voters and residents in this district. It began last winter gathering nomination signatures, followed by greeting citizens at town meetings and local elections this spring, and then marching door to door this hot summer, <laughs> sweating and, and fall, and introducing myself and meeting many hardworking men and women. I'll tell you, it's an awkward moment to see somebody on a riding lawnmower and wonder if they're going to pull around and stop and talk to you. But the best, that's been the best part of this campaign. By a vast majority, the residents in this district are kind and open people. And they've taken a few minutes to chat and explain to me what is important to them. Whether we agreed or not, it was important for me to hear what they had to say. Sometimes it came with a unique twist. I went to one door here in Georgetown and the woman who answered the door was crying, unconsolably actually. And I said, I'll come back. And she said, no, 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 I need a break. She was watching the funeral service that was being televised for Whitney Houston. So she wanted a break. 
So we chatted a little bit and I walked back down the driveway and her husband was driving in and so he rolled his window down and I said, look, when you get home, your wife is crying. It wasn't me. It wasn't, it wasn't our political discussion. Like so many voters I've met, I'm not satisfied with the status quo. I would not be running for this job if I were. Massachusetts is in a constant battle to reevaluate government programs and make changes that fit our times and achieve today's goals. We all want to move forward. We all want to improve what's going on. I respect Lenny for getting in this race for the same reason, and I appreciate the fact that other fellows got in the race in the nomination for the Republican spot. The important job of government is to secure rights and freedoms guaranteed by our Constitution and laws. So government must protect the less fortunate and ensure fairness and justice in the affairs of the citizens. But we must remember this too. Government cannot solve every problem. I know that. And government must regulate society fairly without becoming the problem itself. I will keep those core principles in mind if I am elected to be your representative. Thank you again, and to all of you watching at home, I ask you for your vote on November 6th. Thank you very much. Mr. Mayor? Thank you. I'd like to thank everyone again for coming out here. Um, we have a very important election coming up. All the seats are important. When even a little state rep seat, we'll be choosing the direction that we want our country and our state to take. Now, in this race, I think there's a clear difference between the two candidates. One of us believes that we really don't have to change much in Beacon Hill, that we can continue on our current path. Indeed, my opponent has said on more than one occasion that he thinks the mass economy is doing fine, and he, says, he cites an unemployment figure that might be lower than some other states, but as we've said before, it doesn't count the people who have stopped looking for work or the number of people who are, who are forced to take part-time jobs because they can't find good full-time ones. Moreover, this rate is low in and around Boston but it's a lot higher for other communities and it's a lot higher for the blue collar workers who are not lawyers or government workers or who don't have ties to government. Now I disagree with this view. I think we need to change course. I think we need to get our taxing, our spending and our borrowing under control. We've seen what happens in states that don't do this. We need to look only at Rhode Island or California to see what happens in states under one party rule when state legislators are allowed to recklessly borrow and spend. No matter how often they raise their taxes, and no matter how high they raise their taxes, they can never keep up with their ever-expanding governments. Now, I don't want that to happen here. I don't want to see cities and towns filing for bankruptcy like they're doing in those states. We don't have to let that happen. We can prevent it by electing people that recognize that we're on the wrong road and know us how to get us on the right one. I believe I am that candidate, and I ask you for your vote in November to help me make that happen. Thank you. I went to the Lions debate last night with Barbara Latalian. Yeah. Uh, well, I wish I had her for an opponent. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you. Jim Lyons. Jim Lyons and Barbara Latalian. Can I watch the registered date, please?